Welcome everyone to our program. Good late afternoon or good evening to you, depending on where you are. My name is Mark Kligman. I'm director of the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience. And we're so happy to have you with us at this program. At the outset, I wanna thank our associate director, behind the scenes people, Dr. Lori Black, and also to Beth Kramer for all their help in organizing all of our programs. Before I introduce our special guest for today, I'd like to tell you about some upcoming programs that you can see on the screen. On May 11th, we'll have a program featuring Asher Levy, who will explore Jewish prayer in many languages, from Sephardic Seattle to Syrian Brooklyn, sharing with us music and prayer of the Sephardi Mizrahi communities. This is a four-part lecture series. We hope you can join us, and for all these programs, you could see that you just need to Google UCLA M-A-J-E, UCLA MAGE for American Jewish Experience, .org, UCLA MAGE for all these programs. Our next program is just a few days later on May 13th, Mayorot or Mirrors. This is a really interesting program featuring the music of American Jewish female composers, and that will be on May 13th. Lastly, we will have a program, a two-part program on two successive Sundays in May that will be a workshop in how to sing Yiddish songs by Ethel Rain and Sarah Mayerson, two very experienced performers and singers. We hope you can join us with all of these programs. It gives me real special pleasure to introduce today's guest, Tina Fruhauf, who is an adjunct associate professor at Columbia University and serves on the doctoral faculty of the Graduate City Graduate Center, excuse me, of the City of the City University in New York. She is a very active scholar, having written three books. The first, The Organ and Its Music in German Jewish Culture, published both in German and in English. Her second book, which she co-edited, called Transcending Dystopia, Music, Mobility, and Jewish Community in Germany. Oh, excuse me, that's not her co-edited book. That's her solo author book that just came out this year and another book called Jewish Music in America 2018. I don't know if my virtual screen will let you could see this. It's a wonderful book that really describes Jewish music in America, which is the topic of today's conversation. I met Dr. Fruhauf 20 years ago when I was working in New York City, and it's such a pleasure to see how her work has grown tremendously. At the time I was teaching at Columbia University and uh, I was a part-time faculty at Columbia University and taught a course called uh, Music of Jews in New York. And when I left to come to UCLA, the Columbia faculty asked me, who do I know that would be a good instructor to teach this course? And I said, you have to call Dr. Tina Fruhauf, who not only has taken over this course and has continued to teach it in her own wonderful way, but actually wrote a book about that topic, which is the music of Jews in New York. And it's such a pleasure to welcome you, Tina, to speak to us about experiencing Jewish music in New York, a virtual tour. Dr. Tina Fruhauf, welcome. Thank you very, very much for the warm introduction. I'm greeting everybody live from downtown New York, where I live. I think it's always important to have a sense of space. And so I, I'd like to kind of share with you that I'm in my library, in my home library in Soho. And uh, this is where I've been working not only on books, but I've been also teaching this semester and I'm delighted tonight to take you around virtually to New York. And one day you will be back here and you perhaps can trace all the steps that I'm providing, taking the sounds with you that I'm presenting to you tonight. I say tonight because in New York it's already 7 p.m. I assume not everybody is in Los Angeles. So wherever you are, I hope you have a good hour with me here live from New York. There's no better way than to start a musical tour than with music. So without further ado, let me start by presenting you a mystery piece of music. <laughs> Bye. 
And I stop the very, very long piece right here and I unleash the mystery. This is the oldest and most important nigun of the Lubavitcher Jews. It is known as Dalet Bavos, melody of four stanzas or gates, also known as Raf's nigun or Alter Rebbe's nigun. While nigunim are generally not attributed, this one is believed to be the first nigun by the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, Schnur Salman from the 18th century. Though note that he was not a composer or creator in today's sense, but rather someone who adapted or adopted the melody into Lubavitch. Due to its holiness, it is sung only on special occasions and specific dates, such as the beginning of Elul, the last and holiest month of the Hebrew calendar. Now, this nigun has some specifics, musical specifics, and also textual specifics. It consists of four stanzas. Each of one is intended to elevate the singer and listener to the next spiritual level to ultimately achieve devikut, closeness to God. Each ends with a signature step, with a yearning quality. It's in common time, which in music we call 4-4. Four, four. There's always an iteration of four notes before moving stepwise on. So we have already kind of a pervasive fourness, the four stanzas, the common time for four, the four notes. And um, there is more to fourness because the syllables that um, the um, uh, congregants are using, they are not random. They symbolize YHWH. And uh, that is the tetragrammaton of God's name. We have again, a fourness. Because of its inherent fourness, Dalet Bavos is also referred to as a nigun of the four corners. And it does evoke Spereshit, that is Genesis 28, 14, also known as Ufratsta, and you shall spread out. I like to quote this in English. Your descendants shall be the dust of the earth. You shall spread out to the west, to the east, to the north and to the south. All the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you and your descendants. The inner meaning of this verse is to disseminate the wellspring of Judaism, one of the ideals, core ideals of Lubavitcher Hasidim, as evident in their extensive outreach, think of mitzvah truck and soup kitchen and visit chavat.org. Departing from this Lubavitcher Nigun, this talk walks you to four corners of New York City and the musical cultures and sounds past and present it inhabits. We are starting at a distinct neighborhood at Lincoln Center slash Broadway. From there, we will go to Forest Hills in Queens. Then we go north to Harlem and down to the Lower East Side in the south of Manhattan. And with this, I formally open our walking and my talking tour. And I'm going to share with you a few slides so that you have visual stimulation and you get plenty of sound examples. So allow me to share my screen. And now you should imagine yourself to be at West, uh, in the west of Manhattan, at Broadway, kind of at Lincoln Center, in the Lincoln Center vicinity. So where do I take you musically is the question. It's, it's kind of, seems to be kind of a hard feat, bridging Broadway and Lincoln Center. I will talk with you about Jewish America's favorite musical son, Leonard Bernstein. With the exception of a gap between 1945 and 1963, Bernstein composed some 20 works with Jewish themes or text throughout his career. Tonight, we are looking at one of these works, the so-called Chichester Psalms for mixed choir, soloist and orchestra. Each of its three movements is based on two psalms that address universal human questions and emotions, but more so the work contains a little bit of Broadway placed in Lincoln Center, where its world premiere took place 
in 1965 with a composer conducting. To begin, some background. In June 1964, a year before the premiere of the work, Bernstein was on sabbatical from the New York Philharmonic, which he already had conducted for some time. He said, officially free of chore with 15 beautiful months to kill. His original plan was to conceive another musical based on Thornton Wilder's The Skin of Our Teeth to be directed by Jerome Robbins. But the project didn't come to fruition. But in the meantime, Reverend Walter Hussey, who you see depicted on the slide on the right side, Dean of Chichester Cathedral, commissioned Bernstein to write a piece for the annual music festival that would involve the combined forces of the English cathedrals of Winchester, Salisbury, and Chichester. Hussey gave Bernstein artistic freedom, but he also expressed, and I'm quoting him here, that many would be delighted if there was a hint of West Side Story in the music. I'm now sharing with you the second movement to show that Bernstein took this request quite literally. The first part of this movement is based on Psalm 23, also known as the Psalm of David, in which God appears as a shepherd. The text is often alluded to in popular media and has already been set to music many times. And I'm sure that many of you are familiar with it, but no worries on the next slide, there will be the text. So what did Bernstein do? Bernstein opts for a simple opening set off by the gentle sound of the percussion instruments followed by a solo by a boy alto who sings the first three lines of the psalm, accompanied by two harps. In spite of its simplicity, such opening with a boy solo, boy alto, and the two harps suggest theatricality, evoking images of King David, the famous harpist of the ancient Hebrews, who as a shepherd boy accompanied himself on the lyre. So not as to lose this sense of innocence and naivete and youth, Bernstein specified that the solo is not to be sung by a woman under any circumstance. And like some other work, there is no motivic material in the solo that would identify perhaps to us as Jewish. The melody line is simple and begs to be sung deliberately and honestly without any added vocal embellishments or prepared interpretation. It's a typical Bernstein melody, largely angular with blue notes reminiscent of jazz. And this famous melody that you hear in the very beginning, in just a few seconds, actually originated as the song Spring Will Come Again, intended for this musical that he was supposed to write, The Skin of Our Teeth. Following the opening solo, you will hear a chorus of sopranos divided into two parts, singing almost the same melody, but doing so in canon. And the result is a series of dissonances, kind of harsher sounds, not very soft sounds. And these are well placed because they accompany the text, though I walk through a valley of deepest darkness. Again, the walking theme is inherent in today's presentation. But the canon also supports a more positive interpretation for the section concludes, I fear no harm, for you are with me. This suggests that even when faced with danger, God is always close by, or in this case, literally a musical step behind. And I'd like to um, play this so that you can relive my explanations. This is a chart that I developed. You have many options. You can read transliterated Hebrew on the left or the English translations. And I've reiterated with some notes, some of my explanations on the right side, but you can also just close your eyes and really enjoy this wonderful piece of music directed by Bernstein himself and the beautiful boy's voice. So in, please enjoy. <laughs>
This is just the first part. So there's a sudden stop and for good reason. Recall that um, the line says, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Um, there is where we had the dissonances and um, uh, Bernstein continues with this rather kind of dark mood after a really sudden stop. And uh, I'd like to um, go on to the next slide with that. So now you are familiar with the slide. You can either close your eyes and enjoy the sound or you can kind of read along. So in the second part of this movement, following the innocence of the opening section, Bernstein provides a stark contrast. He walks us into an entirely different sound sphere. He chooses a different psalm, Psalm 2, which is attributed to David and conveys the message that people can either defy the Lord or perish or submit to him and be blessed. In line with the difference that Psalm 2 conveys, Bernstein interrupts the tranquility with what he uh, actually says with the reality of what man has inflicted upon himself. Interruption with everything that sounds low, low strings, percussion, low voices, that is tenors and basses, and a blistering tempo change with a fast allegro feroce. What remains a little bit the same is the play with two musical ideas. Bernstein begins the section with a chorus that he had cut from West Side Story from the prologue, and he just changed the words, literally, he just changed the words from mix, make a mess of them, make the sons of the bitches pay, to why do nations assemble and peoples plot vain things. Again, the music as originally composed for West Side Story, but then was cut, remained exactly the same. We have unpredictable rhythms, we have harsher sounds and a frenzied orchestra. At the mention of the kings of the earth take their stand, the strength of the rulers is represented by strong singing of all voices. They sing all the same melody together with the orchestra. Take note of a march-like melody that begins with the tenors incessantly blaring out Yachad together 13 times, a fight against the bass section's continuation of the text and I'm playing this excerpt and I hope you enjoy it. And again, an abrupt ending because there is a third part of this movement to which I'm going to introduce you now. And the third part is quite simple um, because it really stacks the first parts, the, the music that you heard in the two first parts on top of each other, the high voices and the low voices, combining them kind of in, in an overlay including the psalm text. So you will have problems understanding the text because it sounds like a kind of big rumble. In Bernstein's own words, the movement ends in unresolved fashion with both elements, faith, the first part, and fear, the second part, interlocked. You will hear juxtapositions of very contrasting melody types, rhythm, tempos, and this is maintained at the very end without any resolution.
as many of Bernstein's works, the Chichester Psalms transcend the boundaries of genre, style, and cultural affiliation through a rather eclectic mix of classical and vernacular, Broadway, and Jewish elements, all unique to the concert hall, but all in the service of the text and its perceived <coughs> inherent theatricality. For Bernstein, such eclecticism was not a crutch, but rather a liberating and conscious agent that allowed him compositional flexibility to interpret Hebrew texts and Jewish topics. This led him to a profound conclusion that a renewal of faith in modern times requires a return to innocence, a shedding of the trappings of dogma and a fundamental belief in our common humanity. And with this, we are going to leave Broadway and Lincoln Center and, and walk east to Forest Hills in Queens. Starting in 1972, Queens became one of the largest Bukharan Jewish destinations in history due to the emigration that occurred as Jews of Uzbekistan and Tajikistan immigrated to Israel and the United States due to looser restrictions on immigration. Many of them settled in Queens. And to give you a sense of place, I share here on the slide with you a picture of Beth Gabriel, that's the Bukharian, one of many Bukharian congregations in Queens, one of the largest really. Uh, Ezra Malakaf has served this uh, congregation as a cantor, and um, now you probably expect some cantorial music, but I'm going to disappoint you, and I'm going to uh, give you a different shade of Ezra Malakoff. You see him here on this slide, uh, being part of the ensemble Makam, um, with a few other musicians. You see them all dressed in traditional gear with instruments that perhaps you are not familiar with, and no worries. I'm going to introduce you to um, all of it, to the sound world, after playing a short clip to kind of ease you in into, into a very kind of new sonic world. So here's, here's a little clip um, to warm up. <laughs> with a slide. But um, this is a few, perhaps your first, maybe not your first introduction to an, uh, a genre called shash makam, which means literally six makam in the Persian language. It's a mu musical genre that developed during the 18th century, the golden age of the court of Bukhara. And the name or the genre comprises a repertory of 200 to 250 instrumental and vocal pieces. It's a fixed repertoire. There's no improvisation making music up on the spot. It's in a way classical. It's called Six Makam because it is organized. These 200 to 250 pieces are organized in six collections according to their melody type and the melody type have all four names derived from Persian modes. Before 1920, um, Shashmakam was performed at uh, festivities at the court of Bukhara, but also at so-called toys. These are festivities for life cycle events such as marriage. And this is the repertoire that the ensemble Makam with Ezra Malakov, um, that they are performing. And 
this is what I'm going to introduce you to. So here you see a very, very long list of words and terms that no, I mean, um, perhaps very little to you. This is how a um, Maka Shash Makam performance is constructed. From the 250 pieces, you pick a couple of dozen in order to fill three hours of celebration. And so in order to kind of make this point, I gave you this list and um, I thought that I'm going to introduce you to how such a performance begins. The first piece that um, kind of sets off a Shashmakam performance you already heard. Uh, it's an instrumental piece. And the one that you heard is in a mode that comprises only five tones. You perhaps perceive the repetitiveness. Um, it's uh, called pentatonic in, in our kind of musical, more musical language. So five notes that are always being repeated. And um, the um, instrumental piece is repetitive in itself because it needs to kind of set the stage so that the singers have a sense of, you know, what is the mode of the day? What are the, the kind of tones that we need to get used to? So it's kind of really a, a solid introduction for all the musicians, uh, including the vocalists um, to kind of root the performance. I just played again, just a short excerpt that you um, kind of have the sense of this repetitiveness. <laughs> like this and then followed classically this is always the classical opening you have a vocal piece I um, I posted the translation for you uh, classically the texts are in Persian and uh, that already kind of indicates that you know what is the Jewish connection what is the Hebrew connection there is none in linguistically um, and if you uh, parse the text seeing your beautiful figure, the sun was glad, but seeing your face, the sun felt itself darker. You realize there's nothing religious to it. It's a Persian love poem, basically. So we'll get into what this all means for our Jewish community in Queens a little bit later. But let me first play this that you get a sense of, they're, they're picking up the same notes um, and, um, I don't want to kind of spoil the surprise, but don't be surprised if you hear men and women singing together. You already saw the picture. That's also kind of a hallmark of that performance. <laughs> By the time it's over, our talk will be almost over. So, and our walk too. So I wanna cut this a little bit short, but um, this kind of information um, might give you a sense 
um, of, um, you know, if this piece is nine minutes and the others are kind of 10, 15, 20, this is an evening filling kind of sequence of musical pieces all rooted in um, a very, very different sound. Now, this sound is due to, first of all, the kind of notes that are being played, but also due to the instruments. And I'd like to introduce you to them. First and foremost, the tanvur, a long necked lute, with four strings. It's a central melodic instrument of any Shashmakam performance. And it's kind of, in its approach, um, uh, kind of follows some Western models. It has whole steps and half steps that uh, can be followed, but it can also um, have the notes in between. Um, here's a better look, and you see it's being played with a plectrum. Uh, that's uh, kind of important to know because it affects the sound. But this is not where the metallic buzzing sound is coming from. It's coming from something else. Before we get to that, um, another essential must instrument is the doira. Um, what the doira is all about is the jingles inside. And if you hear a doira in action, you don't hear the jingles. Um, so uh, I have different sound clips. I play one short one. Um, so don't be too sad that you don't hear the jingles because it's such an energetic, really driving performance that uh, the, the kind of drum sound is kind of overshadowing it. And here's a sample from what it sounds like. <laughs> That's it. And the buzzing sound that I promised, that comes from the tour. Um, and um, the reason why it's kind of so buzzing is because it has these double courses. It's a little bit hard to see, but um, if you look kind of closely, you, you see these kind of strings that, that are doubling up and it creates a buzzing sound. Now, um, I mentioned the migration from Bukhara to um, Queens, but I want to go back for a second and um, introduce you a little bit to some history, uh, just so um, that you have a sense of what was talked about, where, where Bukhara is. You see actually on this slide that it's um, in between uh, a bunch of countries. Um, it's in Uzbekistan, but it's bordering Turkmenistan and uh, uh, it's um, also close to Tajikistan. So it, it's kind of a really um, very diverse area. Historically, it was um, kind of the hub of the Silk Road. And um, this is where um, a lot of Jewish traders came through and settled there. Um, but even though Jewish traders settled there, this is not the origin of the Bukharan Jewish population in Bukhara. This goes back supposedly um, to Babylonian times. Um, supposedly the Bukharian Jews are descendants of Persian Jews who migrated eastward. And since the Middle Ages, Bukhara was the largest Jewish settlement in Central Asia. Um, and it was the home of the Bukharian Jews until the 20th century. Uh, until it changed uh, with this, the rise of the Soviets. The Bukharian Jews are considered one of the oldest ethno-religious groups in Central Asia, and they have developed their own culture over the years, but um, Shashmakam uh, is not their own culture. So the migration west began, as I mentioned, in the early 20th century with the Soviet's capture of Bukhara, and before that, it was kind of a, a very, very safe harbor for Jews to live in. Just to give you some uh, samples, I don't have historical um, documentation of Shashmakam performances, but we're talking here about uh, the music of a people. And I wanted to share with you some impressions of the people from a historical perspective. Here's another one. So um, given that um, Shashmakam, uh, when it evolved in the 18th century, was being performed by Hindus, Buddhists, Jews, Christian. It was a co-creation. The question, of course, that you probably have and that I want to answer and address right away is, where's the Jewishness in Shashmakam? So no other Islamic music was as dependent on Jewish artists and teachers as that of Shashmakam. It was really a genre of co-creation. But also there's ownership and responsibility. The Jews who performed Shashmakam really felt it was shared, but it was also their own. And they see themselves even today as the preservers of a tradition. 
they are involved and responsible in the transmission of this musical tradition. And they also felt they preserved a certain originality that went lost when the Soviets dictated how certain musics had to be performed. We come here to performance practice. The Soviets ruled um, ideas about accents, ornamentation, pronunciation, and with uh, the Bukharan Jews migration, they could kind of preserve more original approaches to that. So uh, there is a strong identification which continues to the current day and there are different groups that perform Shashmakam. Not all of them are located in Queens, but Queens is basically the uh, large harbor for the Bukharian Jews in the United States. And with these comments, I'd like to take you north to Harlem, um, to a very specific time period, um, to the 1870s to the 1930s. That was the time when Harlem was the largest Jewish enclave in the world after Warsaw and the Lower East Side. So I should note and share that the Jewish connection to Harlem goes back at least to the 18th century. Though Jews had been always a minority in the neighborhood, um, kind of giving way to larger um, conglomerations of populations like Germans and Italians, and then later the black population. Um, one thing to keep in mind when we talk about size, at one point there were about 170,000 Jews living in Harlem alone. They moved uptown from the Lower East Side or other places, driven initially by wealthier German Jews who were Americanized and who wanted to uh, have bigger places and Harlem facilitated that. But um, a, a lot of this move uptown was also driven by the subway system. It, it really enabled commute around the city and it created a new mobility in the city when, when New York's um, great subway system was being built. Um, so that had also the impact of this on, on this move. Around 1900, we count about two communities that were prevalent in Harlem, the Eastern European Jews and the German Jews. It was kind of a diverse community of poor, wealthy, orthodox reform, but a peaceful coexistence and a strong bond through the Jewish heritage that all of them had in common. Then in the 1920s and 30s, there was a second generation of Jews populating Harlem and it became a space of American Jewry, already an acculturated Jewry. By the 1930s, um, the Jews were driven out by waves of black migrants who came. They were already present above 125th Street earlier. And many Jews moved on to the Bronx. Uh, the Bronx that allowed them to buy bigger houses in Riverdale, for example, and um, was part of an upward mobility. Now, this little map might be uh, interesting for you just to show how many uh, synagogues. Um, there were at least a dozen, if not more, synagogues. Many of them still stand, and I'm doing actually with my students at Columbia University, uh, always walking a walking tour through Harlem, looking at the remnants. Uh, many of these synagogues are now churches, and we are always looking for remnants like symbolism that is, is still prevalent. Uh, so it's uh, actually quite interesting to take this walking tour um, uh, nowadays and not just historically as we do. Now, you're probably expecting that I talk a little bit about one of Harlem's most famous resident, which is George Gershwin and his brother Ira. They had several residences, um, but I will not do so. But I want to reference that Gershwin has been strongly linked to uh, Harlem because uh, he as actually an opera shows that he conceived, Blue Monday, um, which uh, is a jazz opera. It's very short. You can watch part of it on YouTube. And uh, it was later named 135th Street and it really comments on the neighborhood. It's, it's very interesting. But for a walking tour, I want to take you to a different spot, to the heart, to the center of Jewish Harlem, to 111th Street at Lenox Avenue. This is what the site looks today. It's the second Canaan Baptist Church. Um, that was not always so, and we discussed this site historically. Um, this site is supposed to be uh, torn down pretty uh, pretty soon. So um, if you make it to New York, pay it a visit before it's no longer there. Historically, it looked like that. And it was the Lenox Theater built by an American architect, George Frederick Pelham. Uh, he built it in 1911 and um, it became in, in the first years, it was not really clear what was going on there, but it was a theater that was 
rather large, 891 seats. And with this begins the short but significant history of the so-called Lennox Theater. And it was one of several theaters in Harlem offering Yiddish theater productions until it was closed in 1923 already. So what do we know what's going on at Lennox, uh, at the Lennox Theater? We know this from posters and remnants. Um, some of you might know the song by Mir Bister Shane. By Mir Bister Shane uh, had original Yiddish lyrics that were conceived by Jacob Jacobs. And Jacob Jacobs is the man who ran with his partner, Nathan Goldberg, this theater. And um, here you see uh, some, some posters and I wanna link you to um, actually the bigger poster on the right side. You see the person who we are going to hear um, singing Yiddish song, Thomas LaRue. Um, if you can't see him well, you will see him here in full splendor. Who was Thomas LaRue? We know very little about his personal life other than he stemmed from New York. There are lots of myths. Uh, one anecdote uh, tells us that uh, when he was a boy, he was taken to the synagogue, that Cantor was ill. He, even though he didn't seem to be um, bar mitzvah yet, he took the prayer shawl, stood in front of the congregation and sang in a beautiful soprano voice. And initially the sense was we should take him down from the bima, but then he sang so beautifully that everybody prayed along with him. That is a totally unsubstantiated anecdote. Um, as is his singing in, in a Harlem synagogue, there is very little that can be ascertained about Thomas LaRue. He did not seem to have been a part or a product of a black community synagogue or a white one for that matter, um, but he is definitely affiliated with the Lennox Theater and with other theaters like Boris Tomaszewski. Boris Tomaszewski was a really known entity in the Yiddish theater world and he hired Thomas LaRue as well. Now, from this poster, we learned something, uh, some facts. Um, we know that he appeared in a play called Dos Kleid, The Wedding Dress at the Lennox Theater. And uh, it was um, one of the big blockbusters that uh, the producers put on. And in honor of this concert, uh, or of this rather Yiddish theater production, and Thomas LaRue, a benefit concert was given in honor of him. And guess who attended? I hope you know at least one of the name, the famous Josselo Rosenblatt, um, according to this um, poster, was supposed to be uh, in the audience and um, be smitten by Thomas LaRue. Now, um, the decision to hire LaRue was both a canny business decision and an expensive gesture, acknowledging the shifting demographics in the uptown black Jewish enclave. And while it's unclear just how many Jewish uh, black patrons attended the performances, the nightly packed houses attest to LaRue being a really big draw uh, for the Jewish community and those attending these performances. Um, we fortunately have a, a few sound recordings that he left behind. One of them is a Yiddish song that I want to share with you. It's called Don't Give Up Hope, Mr. Jew. And it's a very unapologetic listing of historic tormentors of the Jews. And um, I want to play this for you. I have also the um, English translation so that you can read along. And you'll hear um, his very specific point and tenor voice. Um, and uh, I hope that you kind of get a sense of, of at least his vocal strength. We can't unfortunately see him acting, but here is his voice. <laughs> Man, 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 man
end up to there it's also a longer recording but you can find it on youtube and listen to the end on your own time i hope you get a sense of his kind of cantorial aptness which you hear in the ornaments that he's producing and um it's uh it's quite actually amazing uh, his yiddish i can say is uh, quite superb and uh It's uh, a quite quite astonishing recording from this time. It was, of course, a theatrical novelty to have a black cantor performing Yiddish song. And that is something that came out of the synergy between the Yiddish stage and synagogue music, first and foremost. And uh, it also reflects the show business star status enjoyed by other great cantors. Of course, the most famous of them, Josele Rosenblatt, um, and they were recording artists offering concerts in mainstream venues and were extremely flexible. But now, before we are running out of time, to our last stop, going south to the Lower East Side. So with the Lower East Side, we perhaps reach the most traditional neighborhood that we associate with a Jewish music walking tour. And I present you with the most kind of traditional genre that you can imagine, um, and that is klezmer. Uh, and I want to introduce you also to klezmer through the lens of one of its esteemed performers, and that is Naftule Brandwein, who landed on the shores of America in 1908. He was 24 years old. And like many others in those days, he hoped for a better life and an assured future. And he belonged to the first wave of Kles Morim, who came from the old world with a stout musical background, even though he couldn't read music. He stemmed from what is now Ukraine and was as many Klesmorim born into a family of Klesmorim in a very small town in Galicia. He, um, like many, also settled upon arrival in the Lower East Side. So here you can see him uh, with uh, one of his short-lived bands. Uh, he earned a living by dominating the Jewish uh, wedding circuit. He also played for the underworld. Um, he was somewhat of a um, of a unique person, a womanizer, a gambler, a drinker. There are tons of laws about his eccentric personality. Some of them perhaps uh, are not for everybody's ears, but you can read up on them in, in my book uh, and perhaps elsewhere. Um, he kind of fits a certain stereotype that people had about Klesmorium at the time with eccentricities. But also he had limitations, which I mentioned, the limitation that he couldn't read music. And so he He did not record that much and he couldn't really play with that many bands and not in the Yiddish theater. He was kind of limited. But um, he left still behind um, a bunch of recordings that are worth mentioning. Um, and among them are um, a good bunch of 78 RPM records. One of the pieces that I'm personally smitten with, and that's the reason why I dug it out, is a piece that's often not, not really discussed. It's a little bit of, of, of a unique piece. It's called von Taschlach, New Year's Prayer at the River, and stems from 1926. Um, it's interesting. So as a clarinetist, uh, he uh, decides to be um, accompanied by a violin. Um, the violin used to be the emblematic uh, klezmer instrument, but it wasn't really easy to hear on a recording. So he was playing the solo, the violin was adding a little bit. There was a trombone as a timekeeper, a piano, which attests to some embourgeoisement um, to actually embrace um, an instrument like that, that was not portable and, and really associated with, with the bourgeoisie and a symbol for timekeeping. And that orchestration shows a shift. Um, this piece is really um, kind of interesting in, in the sense of that um, it has a very unique opening uh, step um, that one finds very often in cantorial music. And um, it shows an enormous um, proficiency in um, rendering a melody in a very virtuosic way where you think, This guy doesn't need to read music. He can play technically so beautifully. And without further ado, I want to kind of play the piece so that you get some joy at the end. Mm -hmm. 
And I cut this short. You can also listen to it on YouTube. Um, I just want to kind of point out a few things that are interesting for you to hear and to pick up. It really shows, this recording shows that um, his art is so fluent. It's inventive. It has emotional depth. It's also raw and gutsy. And at the same time, it's incredibly effortless as he easily changes registers. It's very lively. He jumps up and down the scale, covering a really impressive range while sneaking in slides and trills and other embellishments that are really part of the klezmer culture. In other words, or in short, Brandwein, in playing his melody, reveals himself as a relatively unrestrained master. So he has a lot of gestures, he supports the rhythm, um, and uh, it's, it's just a really kind of a joy to listen to the whole tune, which lasts a while. Um, and so I hope you get a chance to kind of catch up with the tune at one point. Just um, a few notes on performance practice. So um, if you're not familiar with klezmer, think of this genre as being improvised. You have a melody, but you never play the same thing twice. That's the golden rule. You change the tempo, you, um, you sneak in ornamentation, um, also known as gestures or dreidel, and they have all Yiddish terms that you can peruse. So these are the hallmarks really of, of what the klezmerim have been producing. Von Taschlich was so popular that in the 1990s, a lot of bands discovered it, the Klesmatics, Rubin and Horowitz, and many others. And it, it received what perhaps today we would call covers in various aspects that are a joy to explore once you kind of find them on YouTube. And um, I don't have time to play the Klesmatics version, but I highly recommend that you um, listen to it on your own. <clears throat> if you want to read up on the Klesmatics version, consult my book, Jewish Music in America and uh, you find a detailed listening guide in there. I want to say in closing that the closing this uh, walking and talking tour with Klezmer music is really not incidental. I wanted to do this because I think that Klezmer is paradigmatic for most musics discussed today, even though it sounds all sound very differently. And for Jewish music in America at large, because all of them are clearly amalgamations of the cultures that surrounds them. They're constantly changing and redefining themselves. They are reflexive of external challenges and internal challenges. And um, Jewish music as such is always assuming different meanings in uh, the context that um, it grows. And so klezmer is, is paradigmatic and you find this in others as well. So what do I leave you with? Uh, not just with a, a picture of my book, but also as you discover um, ever new generations of musics, musical repertoires and musicians that will emerge over time, you will actually see that the idea of um, uh, the redefinition of Jewish music and the amalgamation and the constant uh, redefinition will accompany everything that is going to come. And I can't wait to uh, hear new repertoires, new genres and see what Jewish music in America ought to be in the 21st century. I thank you very much for listening. I hope we have time for questions. Uh, I know that this conversation um, is uh, scheduled to end in 15 minutes, but I also know that the Oscars are on, so you have to decide uh, where you wanna, um, where you wanna go. Uh, I stop sharing my show now with a big thank you again, and I'm happy to receive questions. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Fruhoff, for that wonderful tour, uh, going through many different styles and many different neighborhoods. We really thank you so much. So I know that I, I think we have a few minutes for questions. I know that um, there's one question that came in from Robert Cohen, um, who wanted to know, um, there was a passage from Deuteronomy or Devarim that you had mentioned at the very beginning of your talk. And Robert Cohen just wanted to know which passage that was. It was a passage from Bereshit or, or Genesis, and I think it was 28, um, 14. So if he just takes this down, Bereshit or Genesis 28, 14, this is the passage that I quoted. Okay, thank you. Um, so if anyone would like to raise their hand or put a question in the chat, we're more than happy to recognize and answer your questions. Um, so someone is asking if um, Naftali Brandwine's music was mostly for weddings. Well, this is how he earned a living. But uh, I think that a piece like von Taschlach, the piece that I chose, is not a prototypical wedding piece. It fits into the mold of the, the kind of um, styles called freilichs that are played at weddings. But with a title like this, you know, it, it has really the high holiday association when you do tashla. So um, so that piece, perhaps not. I mean, he was also known to, to play in, in other venues on the Lower East Side. It's just, um, I think he diversified and later on he really uh, focused on the wedding circuit. So there, there, there were different uh, there were different opportunities for klezmer musicians to um, to play. Um, one was to play in an orchestra, the other one was to play in a Yiddish theater, which means playing in an orchestra but not necessarily solo, and then uh, to play in in bars and entertainment établissements um, of all kinds of sorts. Okay, a few more questions are coming in. Uh, I have about four questions. One is, does your book talk about tin Jews uh, who were involved with Tin Pan Alley? Yes, it does. Um, and uh, my book is, um, I, I, I'm kind of, I, I take different approaches. My book is a spatial approach. It looks at different uh, spaces in America at large, um, the synagogue, the Jewish home. And Tin Pan Alley is mentioned, but in a very idiosyncratic way where you don't expect it. There's no own, there's no uh, separate section on Tin Pan Alley, but I bring it up in conjunction with uh, film music. So uh, this is when I talk about uh, specifically one, uh, one piece that originates from Tin Pan Alley, uh, Blue Skies, um, and uh, this is where you find information. Okay, and we want to recognize Judy Nussbaum, who has her hand raised. Uh, would you like to ask your question, Judy? Yes, thank you. I was just typing it. So my question is earlier when we were discussing the Chichester, Chichester Psalm, you mentioned that Leonard Bernstein specifically noted the piece was only to be sung by a male voice. And so I question, do we know that what that directive was related to, how that came to be? Um, Thank you very much for the question and for allowing me to clarify. It's a boy's voice. He wanted to have a boy's voice and not a female voice. There is no religious reason behind this. One could argue religiously. You know, there's the law of Kol Isha. Some of you might be familiar with yes. that. That is, that is not applicable here because this is a piece for the concert stage anyways. Um, but uh, he really wanted to have the theatrical um, kind of vision of the young King David playing the lyre. And if a woman would sing that, who would think of King David if, if you have a full grown woman singing this part? So actually uh, having a boy sing this part really evokes that um, biblical association. And this is what, what um, Bernstein wanted because Bernstein composed theatrically um, in, in most of his pieces really. And his directive ex directives explicitly state a boy's voice. Yes, thank you so much for that clarification. Thank you for your question, Judy. Um, a couple other questions that have come in. Uh, one that I think will be interesting for a lot of people to hear is, uh, what uh, led you to studying Jewish music? 
That's a that's an interesting story. I get I get um, asked this question over and over again, and I always have a different answer. So I kind of wonder what answer do I give to that tonight to this. Well, first of all, um, I have I been. Give a, I think you should give a new one. I should give. I should think of a of a new one. Well, um, you know, my first book was about uh, the organ in Jewish culture, and because I'm a trained organist. Uh, for me, that was fascinating. The fact that, you know, I, I never really heard about organs in synagogues. For me, organs in synagogues were like a total no. And learning about that fact and being a trained organist, that actually triggered my, my curiosity. But um, there are, of course, you know, more complex questions. I had a, I had a complex upbringing uh, in a complex household where religiously I, I just didn't do what I was supposed to do and uh, or what I was assigned to do because um, I grew up in a mixed marriage household, um, religiously mixed marriage. So, so that was, I think, opened me up to being just very interested in, in all kinds of religions and uh, denominations and in spectrums of religion as well. Thank you. Um, so many wonderful comments uh, and questions are coming in. So we'll just take maybe a couple more minutes. Uh, what makes one nigun holier than another? <laughs> Great, I love this question. Well, the short answer uh, is, you know, go to the Lubavitcher and ask why they sort their um, their sefer hanigunim from light to dark nigunim, from the holiest to the least holiest. But of course, I also know the long answer. So, um, so basically, um, uh, in the I believe sometime in the mid 20th century, the Lubavitcher Jews codified their nigunim and they put them into a specific order, and that brought together the book of the Nigunim that they have, which is basically their canonic repertoire. So the, um, the least holiest um, are the ones that are adapted. Like, for example, theoretically, you can take a melody that Simon and Garfunkel have composed. You kind of buy them, you uh, appropriate them, you, you cleanse them, you elevate them, and then you adopt them into the repertoire. So this is a four-stage process that um, actually allows for, uh, for a melody to become a nigun. Um, but because the source is evidently outside, really, of, um, of the Jewish realm and it's secular, uh, it would be one that actually wouldn't be so holy. But the one that I played is really... Th the, the first, the, the one considered to be the very first um, created nigun by a Lubavitcher Rebbe, and as such, it is considered the most holy. So there's this kind of really thinking of what is the source, where does it come from, where's the origin, and uh, that makes one nigun holier than the other. But there's a spectrum, and I think it's very, very important when we think of um, Judaism and Jewishness, not to think of it monolithically, but as a spectrum. And I think that the Sefer Hanigoni makes it extremely beautifully clear in, in their organization of their uh, canonic melodies. Uh, thank you for th these wonderful answers. You're encapsulating so much wonderful information in such a concise and wonderful way. Thank you so much. Uh, this next question, I'd love to hear your answer to this. Has Sephardic music been influential in America? And if, and I should have, of course, brought it in, but I really wanted to discuss Bukharian, uh, Bukharian music uh, with you and the Bukharian Jews. Of course it has. And actually, um, Professor Kligman is a total expert on this, on a specific strand of Sephardic music. He has studied the Syrian um, uh, Sephardic music, the liturgical music has written a wonderful book. So um, if you want to know more about Eastern Sephardim and their music and how it made it to America and unfolded and was canonized here, then uh, you, I, I must defer uh, back to him. But um, Sephardic music in all its spec, again, spectrum and breadth, of course, it's, it's prevalent in the United States. The beauty really about America is that um, America really encapsulates everything. It's because it's, it's an immigrant country. And as such, um, there is a Jewish music of, of every kind of heritage, tradition, and strand prevalent. It's a perfect place to study Jewish music. So uh, maybe we'll just ask a couple more questions. Uh, one is, um, there are just too many to be asked, which I'm very sorry about. Um, what are women's influences in Jewish music? It depends on what you uh, what, what genre you, are, uh, you look like. Um, but 
Jewish uh, women's influences uh, have been increasing dramatically in the course of the 20th century. And I want to go into an area that uh, perhaps um, is not that expected because I always like to surprise people with the unexpected. Um, and that is Hasidic women. So Hasidic women uh, are not really known to have a music industry and market, but they actually have. And as of the 21st century, they have a, a true market with home recording studios, with um, outlets on YouTube that are not visible to everybody, but to many, they, they produce Broadway musicals and so on. So we see actually a, a real strengthening of women, even in um, Jewish pockets that we perhaps do not expect. Um, and uh, if you want to read a little bit more about Hasidic women and, uh, and their involvement in popular music culture, I've, I've written um, a, a kind of pretty big chunk on that in my book, Jewish Music in America. But then also, if we could just switch to something totally, a totally different context, think of um, cantor the cantorial realm and think of Debbie Friedman. And you see actually with Debbie Friedman, actually women uh, really um, gained an influence because she was just such a strong person to um, to leave kind of uh, an imprint on what women can can accomplish. I could go on on this for a very long time. There's a good body of things to read, something lighter, something more academic, and I'd, I'd happy to follow up uh, if people want to know more. And uh, one final question, which I think is really quite fascinating. What do you think about popularizing the Gunim by adding pop instruments and a pop feel? Yeah, that has been done. Um, and uh, there's a group here in New York that before they even um, got um, famous, I saw them uh, running around in Washington Square Park and, and strumming Nigunim on guitars and so on. Um, what I put, if, if I should respond to this from a personal level, then I say, um, for me, anything goes. I'm a musicologist. For me, musicologist for me, um, all music is is important music. Um, and uh, from an academic point, I mean, my academic and personal is actually intertwined. So yeah, what I think, I think it's it's an interesting development that um, my students certainly have taken note on on that writing about Zusha, the band Zusha, that is actually kind of popularizing Nigunim in new ways. Um, and then, of course, Matis Yahu, if you are familiar with Matis Yahu, he has done some of this popularizing in in very few of his works because he's more into reggae and there, but there's still Nigun elements in in some of his reggae. Um, pieces. Um, I think it's it's a very interesting development and I think Nigunim are very relatable. We see that in congregations like uh, Bnei Jeshurun that have used Nigunim for a long time to bring a community together, it allows non-Hebrew speakers to join in. It makes for a good communal experience. There's so much to be said about Nigunim and, and bringing them into different contexts and playing with them musically. There's a lot to be said. So Tina, thank you for a wonderful presentation and just your just breadth of knowledge to really answer all of these questions that are such nicely, nice questions that were, were being asked, really, really wonderful. And um, I um, just think a, uh, a good, another plug for your book, you know, Jewish Music, uh, Experiencing Jewish Music in America, a, listening, a listener's companion. Uh, I really recommend it. It's very, very readable. I mean, I think there aren't many books that really sort of just speak generally to people. It describes music, but not in a technical way. So it's something I really uh, think that anyone interested uh, would really be, would uh, really gain tremendously from. So again, thank you for answering all these questions and we just thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here and for listening. Until next time.